Americans have the right to know what the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Well, drivers across America today are going to fill up their gas tanks and they are going to complain about the price of energy. We are Americans. That is what we do. We love to travel, but we hate to pay high gas prices. But there is also a new complaint. The frustration of filling up your car with ethanol, which is made from food and doesn't burn as efficiently as gasoline, and also the variety of different options of what engine can take what fuel. I didn't bring it with me today, but I have a 2011 vehicle that when you open up the gas cap and on the door itself of my vehicle has a big circle and a slash through it that says E15 telling me, don't you dare put that fuel in this vehicle, even though it is a 2011 version. The Renewable Fuel Standard, the RFS, requires that 35 billion gallons of ethanol equivalent biofuels and 1 billion gallons of biomass-based diesel be refined by 2022. To get there, refiners must have increasing amounts of renewable fuels, like corn ethanol, into gasoline each year. However, when this law was written in 2005 and expanded in 2007, we were living in a different time. And the drafters assumed that gas demand would continue to increase. Since then, the recession and the increased CAFE standards have pushed down the demand for gasoline. There is increasing evidence that RFS is not meeting the original bifold purpose, to move the United States towards greater energy independence and security and to increase the production of clean renewable fuels. Another market change since 2005 and 2007 is the current domestic energy boom, leading us to greater energy independence and security by leveraging our domestic petroleum supplies. Second, corn-based ethanol may not be any cleaner than gasoline and has other negative environmental consequences, such as using more water for producing corn-based energy than refining gasoline. To account for these future uncertainties, Congress gave the EPA waiver authority to suspend RFS requirements for various reasons. EPA may waive the requirements if there is an inadequate domestic fuel supply or if implementation of a requirement would severely harm the economy or environment of a State region of the United States. Last year, for example, in response to catastrophic drought conditions, several governors petitioned for a waiver. Although EPA found that the drought had created significant hardships, particularly for livestock producers, EPA did not grant the waiver. Now we have a new challenge. It is called the blend wall. Because the law requires increasing amounts of renewable fuels to be blended into gasoline each year, if demand for gasoline goes down, the only way to meet the standard is by blending a higher percentage of ethanol. Currently, it is not uncommon to see E10 or the 10 percent ethanol fuel. This year, however, refiners predict they will have to blend into E15. This presents two problems. It may be a defective product. Many automakers will void warranties if motors use anything higher than E10 in their cars because of the engine damage it can cause, especially to older cars, boats, engines, and uh, non-vehicle motors, and as I have already mentioned, for my truck at home as well, even though it is a newer vehicle. Consumers don't want it at times. In my home state of Oklahoma, you will frequently find gas stations advertising pure gasoline containing no ethanol in response to consumer demand. It is not uncommon to see a gas station in Oklahoma City with a giant banner out front of it that says, we sell real gas. By requiring refiners to pr produce a product that consumers can't use and don't want, it is only logical that this constriction of the market will increase fuel prices, causing economic damage as well. According to a study done by the economic consulting firm NERA, mandating E15 could increase the cost of gasoline by as much as 30 percent by 2015 and increase the cost of diesel by as much as 300 percent by 2015. In addition to refiners and consumers, other stakeholders are affected by this market distortion. Because of the over-reliance on food-based ethanol as a renewable fuel, the RFS has a negative impact on our food supply and security. The goal of this hearing is to see how we can alleviate the pressure on consumers. One way to do this is to change the law. That is the job of the Energy and Commerce Committee, not this committee. This committee oversees how the executive branch is implementing the current law. Today we will seek to learn what EPA can do, has done, or maybe has not done to ease the burden on consumers. I thank the witnesses, all of them, for their participation today, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentlelady from California, Mrs. Speer, for her opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have a solution for you with your 2011 car. Um, I just drove halfway across the country in my 2008 Prius. 
um, that takes any amount of fuel from any of those gas stations and got me 45 miles to the gallon. So I highly recommend Priuses um, as potential cars for the future. I, I could actually, with my Ford truck, put that Prius in the back of it. Actually, <laughs> so, yeah. It's very roomy inside. I'm going to take you for a ride in it. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Let me start off by um, reading this quotation. Our prediction, if things go very, very well, is that renewables could supply somewhere in the order of 30 percent of the world's energy demands by the middle of this century. Now, as you think about who might have said that, I'm sure lots of um, ideas come to mind that they may indeed be biofuel um, producers. But it, as it turns out, the person who made this statement was the president of Shell Oil Company, Marvin Odom, in Qatar at a recent uh, conference that took place there. So this is Shell Oil Company talking about the benefits of renewables. The majority has chosen today to focus this hearing on only one aspect of the renewable fuel standard, our nation's signature law promoting the transition to cleaner fuel futures that Shell Oil and others say is on the rise. The so-called blend wall is an important and pressing issue for agriculture, refiners and consumers. However, as we address the blend wall, we must not lose sight of the forest for the trees. The RFS on the whole is about national security, clean energy innovation and job creation. As a matter of fact, domestic biofuels have created 400,000 jobs and $50 billion in new activity. Mr. Chairman, I have a letter here from Congressman Bruce Braley that I would like to submit for the record that references the fact that our hearing today does not have one uh, renewable fuels producer um, testifying. And in his state, there are some 39 ethanol plants with over 3 billion gallons of annual fuel production. Uh, offering jobs to 63,000 people and about two of the first cellulosic ethanol plants in the entire nation are under construction in his home state. Those two plants coming online will generate uh, 6 million tons of biomass available to convert to cellulosic ethanol. So I would like to submit this for yep, the record. Without objection. In light of calls from some quarters to repeal the RFS, I would remind my colleagues that the RFS originated as bipartisan legislation designed to achieve these critical goals. The RFS was first included in the 2005 Energy Policy Act under a Republican Congress and was signed into law by President Bush. In 2007, the law was expanded with passage of the Energy Independence and Security Act, also signed into law by President Bush. To be sure, I have my own concerns over the impacts of the renewable fuel standard on our vehicle fleet, on the food versus fuel problem, and on our environment. The law's implementation has been far from perfect. But make no mistake, the EPA is charged with administering the RFS according to the law that Congress passed, and the RFS is still a relatively new policy. The EPA must use the flexible authority Congress granted it to ensure the RFS stays on track to meet our national clean energy goals. I look forward to hearing from the EPA today on how the agency intends to weed out any waste or inefficiencies in the programs and protect the integrity of its program moving forward. Moreover, as business works to scale up the production of cellulosic and other advanced biofuels, now is not the time to throw the baby out with the bathwater by undermining the law before it has a chance to succeed. We are only one-third of the way into the RFS program, yet renewable fuels remain capable of creating 52 billion gallons of biofuels annually, decreasing dependence on foreign oil, reducing trade deficits, creating jobs, and reducing air pollution. The path forward demands continued support for those innovative technologies to produce alternative fuels such as biobutanol, cellulosic ethanol, green diesel and green gasoline in order to provide clean energy now and for future generations. Thanks to the RFS, the first two commercial scale second generation biofuel plants to be built in the U.S. are coming online this year. 
employing hundreds of Americans and injecting millions of dollars into local economies. Companies in Florida, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Texas, and Wyoming are leveraging the RFS to build the next wave of biorefineries in the years ahead, and not with one taxpayer dollar. In short, keeping the renewable fuel standard on track is critical if America is to succeed in the clean energy race of the 21st century. These are not Democratic goals or Republican goals. These are American goals. Our Nation's top scientists and military commanders have repeatedly and urgently signaled the need to move forward on alternative fuels. At the end of the day, the question we need to ask is whether we want to produce real alternatives to oil in our fuel supply or not. American families who continue to suffer the consequences of a transportation system that is more than 95 percent dependent on oil know the answer to the question is yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also have a couple of other documents to submit for the record. One is from the Biotechnology Industry Organization and the other from the Advanced Biofuels Association. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one more point. Um, we also are in the middle of the mark on the National Defense Authorization Act, of which uh, I am a member of, so I am going to have to move between committees for the next two hours, and I apologize in advance for my um, inability to be here for the whole hearing. We will we'll make sure that uh, when we are talking about you, it is when you are gone then. How Thank you. Okay. M members will have seven days to submit opening statements as well for the record, and we will now recognize our first panel. Mr. Uh, Jack Gerard is the President and CEO of the American Petroleum Institute. Mr. Joel Brandenberger is the President of the National Turkey Federation. Dr. Jeremy Martin is the Senior Scientist of the Clean Vehicles Program of the Union of Concerned Scientists. And Mr. Lucien Pugliarsi is the President of the Energy Policy Research Foundation. Gentlemen, thank you all for being here. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are sworn in before they testify. If you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement, of course, will be made part of the permanent record uh, for this hearing. Mr. Gerard, you are up first, it looks like. Uh, we will be honored to be able to receive your testimony. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Speer and the members of the subcommittee. It is a privilege to be with you today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you API's concerns regarding the renewable fuel standard. API, as you are probably aware, represents all aspects of the Nation's oil and natural gas industry. We support employment for over 9.2 million Americans, constitute over 7.7 percent of our gross domestic product, and deliver more than $85 million a day to the Federal Government in the form of taxation, royalty, and other sorts of revenue. With the limited time we have today, I'd just like to move right to the point. The renewable fuel standard is irreparably broken and poised to do significant harm to consumers, the economy, and the nation's fuel supply. The impact of the mandate has been made worse by EPA's unwillingness to let science, court decisions, and common sense guide its implementation. Now EPA is currently facing the biggest test of all that's been mentioned already this morning the E-10 blend wall. The renewable fuel mandates in the renewable fuel standard increase yearly. While demand for fuel in the United States is dropping, creating a situation known as the E-10 blend wall. When this happens, refiners will be forced to blend the fuel with more than 10 percent ethanol or reduce production to meet the mandate, thus creating a crisis for consumers whose automobiles are built and warranted for E10. In fact, most consumer engines are designed for an E10 blend, including small engines such as motorcycles, boats, and lawnmowers. EPA's actions to approve E15, despite scientific evidence showing millions of automobiles could face engine and fuel system damage, is an unnecessary risk to consumers, to automobiles, and to small engines. Quite frankly, EPA's implementation of the RFS is galling. The agency has continued to set unrealistic cellulosic standards since 2010, resulting in refineries having to pay the government a fee for a fuel that doesn't exist. Further, even after the industry successfully sued the government 
for the return of our phantom fuel fees, EPA doubled down on its indefensible action by setting the 2013 target volume even higher, flouting the U.S. Court of Appeals decision issued just days earlier striking down their 2012 mandate. To give you a big picture view of the problem, let me summarize the study conducted by NERA Economic Consulting that Chairman Lankford mentioned earlier. The study found that once the blend wall is breached, the costs associated with diesel fuel would increase by 300 percent by 2015. Costs associated with gasoline would increase by 30 percent by 2015. In broad economic terms, the RFS could cause a $770 billion decrease in U.S. GDP by 2015 and reduce take-home pay for American workers by $580 billion. Staggering numbers. Keep in mind all of this stems from EPA's dogged enforcement of an obsolete law which was written at a time of assumed energy scarcity for our nation and heavy dependence on foreign sourced energy. That is not our reality today. These impacts are unnecessary. The fact is the blend wall and its harmful impact on consumers could be prevented today if EPA would simply use the waiver authority mentioned earlier contained in the law to waive the RFS completely or to at least waive down the volumes below the 10 percent. Bottom line, EPA must act now to avoid the impending blend wall crisis. Longer term, in our view, the best solution is for Congress to repeal the RFS once and for all. The stakes are simply too high for inaction, which could cost consumers millions of dollars, place at risk small engines and automobiles, and unnecessarily burden an already shaky economy. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Brandenburg. So get your button yep. right there.
both oil and corn ethanol. The, the solution is not to lock in the status quo. We need to move forward with the next generation of advanced biofuels. To get there, we need a stable renewable fuel standard uh, to serve as a foundation for investments in biofuels made from waste products, agricultural residues, and environmentally friendly uh, energy crops. For this reason, we do not support legislative changes to the RFS. According to our analysis, ample domestic biomass resources are available to support RFS targets, and developing these biomass resources will provide economic opportunities, rural development, and good jobs, not just in the Corn Belt, but all over the country. What is needed is to scale up the industry that will convert this biomass into clean fuel. The first commercial scale cellulosic biofuel facilities are now starting up in Florida and, and Mississippi, and several more are under construction in Iowa and Kansas. But while this progress is encouraging, it will take time to scale up a new industry, as it did for the oil and corn ethanol industries. In the meantime, the gap between the schedule laid out in 2007 and the actual scale up uh, means that EPA needs to adapt their implementation of the RFS to today's circumstances. We have done extensive analysis informed by the work of agricultural economists across the country and around the world on the options EPA has to administer the RFS consistent with the law that Congress passed in 2007. The smart approach is to limit the mandates for food-based fuels to 20 billion gallons in 2022. Under this approach, biofuels continue to grow, but at a slower rate than we have seen over the last few years, which will reduce pressure on food markets and slow agricultural expansion. Growth beyond this limit should come from non-food-based cellulosic biofuels. Realizing the full 36 billion gallon ambition of the RFS is critical to delivering on the economic and environmental benefits of the RFS, but our analysis and experience over the last few years shows that expanding food-based biofuels is not the smart path to get there. Biofuels are now a major factor in U.S. and global agriculture markets, and so the implementation of the RFS must be informed by and responsive to agricultural market factors. Failure to do so doesn't just raise food prices, it undermines the goals of the RFS itself. We also need to acknowledge the challenges of adapting our vehicles and infrastructure to a changing set of fuels. What is called the blend wall is in reality more like a set of speed bumps. There is no reason we need to fuel up with at least 90 percent gasoline forever but we do need to proceed with caution. Today's RIN prices provide the economic driver to support expansion of drop-in biofuels and higher ethanol blends. But if we try to change our fuel mix faster than our vehicles and fueling infrastructure can accommodate, we may set back the transition we need to make. Under the RFS implementation strategy, we advocate the scale-up of a transition of our fuel mix, our vehicles, and our fueling infrastructure. Congress gave EPA the tools and flexibility it needs to administer the RFS in a smart way, uh, adapting to changes that were unforeseen in 2007. Uh, opening the RFS now will create regulatory uncertainty, delaying investment in the real solutions that the RFS is delivering. Instead, EPA needs to work with uh, DOE, USDA, and all the stakeholders to set ambitious but realistic goals for the next phase of the RFS from 2016 to 2022 consistent with the constraints in agricultural markets and, and vehicle and fueling infrastructure, but moving forward on the oil saving and climate solutions we need. The infrastructure for gasoline and corn ethanol is already uh, built out, and they will be around with or without the RFS. What is at stake is the next generation of biofuels, fuels that do not compete with food and offer dramatically lower carbon emissions. We are not moving forward. Again, for the opportunity to be here today. I have uh, provided additional details in my written testimony, and I would look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Mr. Pugliarsi. Uh, yes. Uh, Chairman Langford, uh, Ranking Member Speer, and members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Renewable Fuel Standard and uh, EPA's management of this program. Of particular importance is EPA's use of its waiver authority, which will shortly become the most important policy instrument in determining the path of gasoline and diesel prices over the next two to three years. My testimony today
pay down the price of E85 and to put that cost in E10. This is why NERA gets such devastating uh, consequences on the national economy. Rising gasoline prices are like an excise tax. A 50 cent increase in gasoline prices takes $70 billion out of consumers' wallets. Next slide. The fundamental problem with E85 is it is too costly. At no time since, two, since 2000 have we seen E85 be more uh, you know, cost effective to E10. This is the fundamental problem. You can't get consumers to buy it for performance reasons, but you can't also get them to buy it because it is too expensive. Next slide. This is Minnesota, a place not un familiar to E85, a place in which uh, ethanol is embraced. But as you can see, even as the number of fueling stations and outlets for E85 continued to grow, consumer demand, consumption of E85 fell. Next slide. Uh, one issue that uh, some of the uh, proponents of the mandate, and by the way, we are not against ethanol. We think ethanol is a very valuable and important uh, blending component for the production of gasoline. We need it. It helps us to meet our oxygenate and our fuel specification standards. But as you can see, there is no, no real constraint in adding additional fueling options at American uh, service stations. There has been enormous growth in electric outlets, enormous growth in CNG. E85 is not showing up at gasoline stations because the consumers don't want to buy it. Uh, next slide. I think we have spoken about this a bit, but as you can see, uh, the forecasts of long-run demand for gasoline and for diesel fuel have fallen dramatically from when we first put this program in place. This is why we are running up against the blend wall so quickly. And finally, the last slide. You know, uh, all three conditions that were prevalent when uh, the uh, renewable fuel standard was passed, which was rising imports, falling production, and rising demand, every one of those conditions are no longer with us today. And I would like to so finally, so where we are now is we have this enormous strategic opportunity. The developments we have seen in uh, shale gas are now moving to liquids. And uh, our production path from now to 2022 is an, is an enormous shift. It is a paradigm shift. And basically, we are now at the position, position in which we have a large number of regulatory programs which are running head on against this renaissance. If we can't figure out how to build out the midstream in a cost effective way and have a processing technologies that are cost effective, we will push some of this crude back in the ground. So uh, with that, I will conclude my testimony. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, we will uh, work our way through questions here five minutes at a time as uh, we get a chance to pass these questions around. Uh, we'll, uh, if we have a moment, we will get a chance to follow through on some of those as well, depending on our time period. On it. Mr. Gerard, uh, let me just tell you a quick story, and this is for all of you as well. You spoke specifically of fuel prices and of the increase, and several of you did, of the price of fuel and as it goes. I spoke to an eighth grade class uh, two weeks ago in Roosevelt Middle School which is one of the poorest areas of Oklahoma City. And they submitted their questions to me in advance. Um, and as I flipped through those questions, I was stunned at the number of them that asked the question about gas prices and for their particular family to say, what can be done because our family is having a tough time getting to work now and getting back and forth to school and writing statements of, I may have to walk in the days ahead. Uh, because we cannot afford the gasoline. The, the statements that were made about what is really coming on the consumer, both in the price, as Mr. Brandenburger mentioned, of food and of fuel, that is a real issue that we are facing right now for people that are the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. What, what can be done right now for EPA to provide some certainty in what is going to happen in energy prices for the next year? Well, there's probably a number of things EPA could do. The first and foremost, back to the renewable fuel standards, though, send a signal to the marketplace that we're not going to put undue pressure 
use the waiver authority to not put undue pressure on the prices that exist today. Just very quickly, Mr. Chairman, I know that you understand this. The key drivers behind the price of gasoline are first crude oil, traded on a global marketplace, and second is taxation. Every state imposes somewhere between 35 and 70 cents a gallon on what it is that is produced. But what we are coming against in the renewable fuel standard is the blend wall, where government mandate is going to force us to make a decision as refiners. If we break through that blend wall and get forced to produce a fuel that the auto manufacturers have said, don't put that in our cars, back to your car situation, because it is going to hurt the engine and they are not going to function well, or do we get compelled in the marketplace to begin to move back on our production, thus changing the fundamental supply and demand equation, putting upward pressure on the price? So EPA needs to move quickly to, with their waiver authority, to send a signal to the marketplace, we are going to take this one variable out of play and not put upward pressure on the price of our fuels. As NERA reports, and I like to submit that for the record if it is appropriate, Mr. Chairman. The without, potential without here is staggering. The reason those numbers only go to 2015 is because it is so staggering and so infeasible, the model doesn't work after that. When you drive the price of diesel, the costs associated with diesel upwards of 300 percent, there is no place else to go in 2016. You have broken the system. That is how serious this is. EPA's announcement to the marketplace we are going to relieve, relieve the government pressure and get us back to a pure free market would go a long way. Okay. Mr. Brandenburg, you mentioned some of the same things dealing with uh, food as well and the price of food, but you also, uh, in, in your testimony, both orally and written, uh, referenced the, the shift in jobs that is occurring. As we are seeing an increase in jobs in corn-based ethanol and cellulosic and, and some of the renewable fuels, we see a dramatic decrease in job in the agricultural industry as well. Uh, can you go into greater detail on that? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Um, even a small to medium-sized turkey plant will provide several hundred jobs. A very large ethanol plant won't come close to providing the same number of jobs. So there's been a, there's been a real shift in in in, in rural America. Um, as I mentioned, our production is still around 10 percent below its all its 10-year high. It's still about six to seven percent below where it was in 2008. And those are real jobs that are lost. We have a lot of people about to be out of work in North Carolina when the last turkeys run through the plant I mentioned there. There are a number of workers in California whose future is uncertain when the second largest turkey company there had to move to Chapter 11 protection. Uh, and this is going to continue. And, and, and the problem comes as well, just very briefly, is in both, in both instances when the RFS has had a real impact on corn prices, it has come at an exact moment when the meat and poultry industry already had other problems that affected it. So they start trying, you know, there comes a limit to how much of cost can be absorbed. You have to start passing it along to your customer. If the economy is not strong, the customer quits buying the product, and then you get into a vicious cycle where supplies grow and, and plummet. It's, 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 it's a vicious, vicious cycle. We, we have faced this before. And in, in 1979, the government at that point, um, uh, Jimmy Carter was president. And the famous Malay speech made a speech to say that by the year 2000, because the Federal Government is going to coordinate all these efforts, 20 percent of the energy used in the United States will be done by solar power. And they were going to put a process in place to make sure 20 percent of the energy used in the United States was going to be solar by the year 2000. Obviously, that goal was not achieved, not even close at that point. You can make the plan and make the proposal and say this is what is going to happen, but if the technology is actually not there to do it, you can't actually get it there. As has been mentioned before, we can make this statement to say we are going to burn this much fuel, but if that fuel is not economically viable, if it is not really there, if the cellulosic fuel doesn't exist, as you mentioned before, the phantom fuel that is out there demanded to be used, we can make all the Federal demands we want to make. That doesn't mean it actually exists in the real world. That is the challenge that we are facing currently right now. As much as we would love, as Dr. Martin mentioned, as much as we would love to get away from food-based fuel, it doesn't exist in the quantities that is needed to actually achieve that. And we have got to find some solutions to this in the days ahead. With that, I yield uh, to the Ranking Member, Mrs. Speer, for our questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I am somewhat baffled by our discussion so far. It is almost like we are going to say we really can't move forward, we have to move backwards. 
Uh, I think that Dr. Martin made a, an excellent suggestion about how we can fix your problem, Mr. Brandenberger, when he said you could cap uh, the amount of corn ethanol that can be produced that would then kind of up the opportunity for cellulosic. Um, what do you think about Dr. Martin's proposal? Well, the, the, the amount of corn-based ethanol is about two, three years away from being capped at 15 billion gallons anyway under the law. It's, it's already approaching 14 billion gallons. We are already having enormous problems. If you are talking about capping it where it is today or even capping it slightly below where it is today, there could potentially be some benefit. But if you are talking about following the cap already in law, I, I don't think that will that will give us or any of our brethren in the livestock and poultry world a, a whole lot of relief. Okay. So there is some opportunity here for both to flourish, for corn ethanol and cellulosic ethanol and for turkeys to be properly fed. And we just need to find a way to get to, to, to a happy medium here. Because here is the problem. The oil production is going to cap, even with fracking, in very short order. So we have to be prepared with alternatives. We have oil companies that are saying they are moving in that direction. BP for a while there was saying beyond petroleum, although they have kind of abandoned that particular moniker today. The military, the Navy, wants to have 50 percent of its fuels coming from biofuel by 2020. So we cannot just dig our heads in the sand here. Now, Dr. Martin, um, can you comment on what Mr. Brandenberger has just um, said? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. I think you're exact. I mean, the the point here is to address some of the the near-term challenges that that people have raised, and and there certainly are challenges. view of this policy, but a longer view is necessary. You didn't build the oil industry overnight. Uh, we didn't build the corn ethanol industry overnight. And so, you know, between now and 2015, you know, we're not going to build a, a cellulosic biofuel industry that's the scale of the oil industry. Uh, so we need a, a steady uh, path forward that, that allows uh, investors the confidence to, to build this next industry and, and to create the jobs and opportunities that will come with it. Uh, the reference that Mr. Brandenberger made to jobs, I think, doesn't square with some of the realities that we're seeing. And so I'd like to point out that uh, the Enios uh, plant in Vero Beach, Florida, uh, is a cellulosic biofuel plant. Will produce eight million gallons of ethanol from municipal solid waste create more than 400 jobs and contribute more than $25 million into the Florida economy. Kior in Columbus uh, is Mississippi will produce ethanol from woody biomass yielding over 13 million gallons of gasoline, diesel and other fuel oil blend stocks. The $220 million facility is expected to create several hundred jobs during operation and over 500 jobs on site during peak construction. Additionally, there are new plants either in the planning stages or under construction in as many as 20 states and Canadian provinces, including Blue Fire Renewables in Anaheim, California, Poet DSM, Advanced Biofuels in Scotland, South Dakota, and Fiberite in Lawrenceville, Virginia, to just name a few. So here we ha have a, a real jobs engine being produced, um, real hopeful technology. Uh, an opportunity to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and we are somehow suggesting we have got to just cut this off and repeal uh, the RFS. Mr. Martin, can you describe the new technology that is allowing these facilities to produce these volumes of cellulosic biofuel? Uh, not in a few seconds, but there's, uh, one of the really exciting things is that there is not just one technology. There is there's quite a different uh, a variety of technologies. Some of them are biological. Some of them are thermochemical, uh, and, and they would take some time to get into. But different uh, technologies are suitable to different feedstocks. And so we have a lot of opportunities you know, it, that, that can, that can uh, create different types of fuel using different types of resources you know, all over the country. Uh, and, and so I think that, that is the opportunity that is in front of us. 
and, and that is why it is so important to, you know, to move forward. Thank you, Doctor. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for calling this hearing. It, uh, this is uh, something that actually affects every single American. It affects them at the, at the table where they eat. Uh, it affects them in their pocketbook at a time where we are struggling with jobs and the economy. Uh, this is not something uh, the American economy can continue to sustain. Uh, uh, Mr. Gerard, I would like to ask you a couple of questions about the economic impact of what in, in the blend wall specifically. I know there was this NERA report. Could you talk to that? I believe it said it re would result in a $770 billion decline in the, in the GDP. Explain the economics behind that. Yes. What, <clears throat> what NERA did is they went back and they looked at the situation on the renewable fuel standard and and I wish Ranking Member Spear were here because there's a there's a key connection I think with some of her comments earlier, and that is that we can all hope for the new fuels, the cellulosics, and other thing Dr. Martins have talked about. The reality is the statute mandates, and it's forcing as if somehow it's going to compel technology to produce a fuel that doesn't currently exist. Cellulosics a perfect example. I think everyone would hope we have cellulosic fuel today. The oil and natural gas industry happen to be some of the largest investors in some of these renewable alternative forms of energy. The problem is it doesn't exist today in the quantities necessary, but the statute mandates the blending of them. We paid millions of dollars to the EPA under the statute, finally got a court to compel them to give our money back, paying for fuel that doesn't exist. So when you look at the nearest study, what they did is took the assumptions under the statute, what the law required us to do and said, what does this result in? And we have four fundamental options. We can either cut back production because we can't meet the standard, therefore the volumes we are producing are limited, and our requirement to certify we are using it called a RIN, a renewable identification number, is met. Or we can try to go to the E85 that Lou talked about, which the public has already said, we are not going to buy that fuel. It is less efficient, essentially costs us more. We can go to E15, which is the approach the EPA has taken. Incidentally, all the research shows, and every automobile manufacturer, as asked by Congressman Sensenbrenner last year, said we will not warranty our cars if you put E15 in them. And the last option is we can export the gasoline. Why? Because we don't have to blend the piece we export. So you are driving us in a position in the United States where we have no alternative, no place to go. The NERA analysis says that greatly escalates price and therefore could add to the cost of producing diesel upwards of 300 percent, gasoline 30, taking $770 billion out of our economy as a result of the, tri and, the and, and ripple effect. And, and so what's happened to the ethanol RINs? Uh, my understanding is that uh, this it traded as a commodity. Uh, in early 2013, it was about five cents per gallon. Is now It moved at one point up over north of a dollar per gallon. It's now, at least uh, on May 30th, it was 89 cents. What's the economic impact of that? What does it What does it mean for a regular family who's got a regular job and and just trying to get by? Well, experts uh, predict different things, but the bottom line is this: the price of the RIN, the renewable identification number that we have to buy to certify we blended the fuel, has increased over 1,400 percent in the last few months, over the last four or five months, and that's being driven by the expectations of the market. The market can see the blend wall. The market understands the blend wall is upon us. And just like the EPA action, thinking they are going to take pressure out of the blend wall by forcing us to create a fuel that we understand will damage automobiles, that is where we stand as an industry. It is a hard thing to answer. The bottom line is that it adds to cost. Clearly, everything this government mandate will do prospectively, just like Nira concluded, significantly adds to costs and impacts the consumer. The cost of running an automobile to, to run in that tractor to, uh, to the airline tickets that you are going to buy, it is all going to be effective. In my last few seconds here, Mr. Brandenburg, the, uh, explain bigger and broader than just turkeys how feed is affected and what that does to the price. I mean, turkey is one of the most consumable products we have out there. It's such a staple in the American diet. What, ex, go a little deeper in the economics and what this does to this industry. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, in, 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 in to sort of lay the foundation for that, two things to what we have been discussing here today. We are going to try to play it very straight. 
with the subcommittee when we talk about jobs. We are talking about permanent, ongoing jobs in the plants themselves, not construction jobs that are created, not the many other jobs that are created in the support industry. We are talking about permanent jobs in the plants. And, and to give it a broader case, in all livestock and poultry, corn is the top feed ingredient. It is true for chickens, true for hogs, true for cattle, and true for cattle in the feedlots. Um, we have created a situation where when we have a year like last year, when there was such a severe drought, we have got corn stocks down near historic lows, you know, we have to compete in the market for that corn. But the Federal Government has said one person gets to go to the head of the line because their customers have basically a regulatory gun to their head. Their customers have, you know, to blend. The ethanol industry's customers have to take their product. We don't have a turkey consumption standard or a chicken consumption standard or a beef consumption standard. You know, our customers don't have to buy our products. The ethanol industry's customers have to. That gives them an incredible advantage when competing for corn in a short market. So I hope that maybe clarifies a little bit just exactly what the ripple effect is. We don't have an ability always to pass our costs along. Thank you, Chairman. You'll back. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. Um, well, lucky for the turkey industry, I have to buy your product because I don't eat pork or beef. So that's, that's my main source of protein. So you, you have one big consumer here. Um, Thank you. You are welcome. Um, well, uh, Dr. Martin, I would like to ask you uh, a question. People might be thinking I am being facetious, but I am being serious. What scientists are concerned, why are they concerned, and what are they concerned about when you talk about concerned scientists? Uh, thank you. Uh, we are concerned about uh, a variety of problems. Uh, probably at the top of the list is, is climate change. Uh, but we are also concerned about other impacts that, that oil causes uh, to our economy, to our security, and, and as I already mentioned, to the climate. Uh, and we have other programs working on, on, on issues related to, to food and agriculture, to tropical deforestation, to global security. So we work on a variety of issues and we are concerned about all of them. Okay. Well, thank you for your concerns and the effort you are putting into that. Um, I have a question to uh, Mr. Gerard. Um, you mentioned earlier something about costs increasing by 300 percent. What were you referring to under what time frame and what is the cause, potential cause of that? That is the NERA analysis I just mentioned to Congressman Chaffetz, who is here. And we are happy to provide that for the record. <clears throat> but what it does, Congressman, is we come to this E10 blend wall where we are forced to make decisions because they are pushing us into creating fuels, if you will, that the market cannot accept for technological reasons. <laughs> We then get put in a position where we've got to find ways to uh, justify our document that we're doing what the law requires us. And therefore, the options to us are limited, but some of those options include to take fuel, for example, and to uh, reduce the amount that we produce. The study itself, I believe, references this as rationing. And so when you begin to impact the market by government mandate like that, of course, others seeing this coming. Uh, react to it, and this particular economic group concluded that that would drive costs associated with diesel as high as 300 percent higher and gasoline 30 percent higher, in addition to the impacts on take-home pay and decrease in GDP activity. Okay, so basically those are potential uh, potential increases. They're not charted actual increases. They're potential increases based on cause and effect. Correct. Uh, correct. Uh, predicted to occur within the next two years. Mm -hmm. And you represent the American Petroleum Institute. So are they, if, if they had to write a letter right now um, and say um, either they are going to put in their letter to Congress um, about RFS, would that letter be talking about eliminate RFS or modify RFS? Well, we would take two approaches, Congressman. First thing we would do is we would suggest EPA act immediately under their waiver authority to send a signal yes. to the marketplace take the pressure out of it. Mm -hmm. The second approach we would take right now is a repeal request. The reason we would pursue repeal, we believe the statute has become so complex and convoluted that we ought to step back and start over and look at the new reality we are faced with in the United States today, where we produce a lot of our own fuel right here at home, and we are able to produce even more here at home in the forms of oil and natural gas. We should look at those realities to secure our own energy future 
Right now, part of the mandates required on the renewable fuel standard require significant imports from Brazil of sugarcane ethanol. Well, if the statute was originally enacted to get us off foreign imports, all we have done is shift it from one commodity to the other. Mm -hmm. So we would ask for repeal and then step back and say, okay, what is the vision of the country as it relates to renewable fuels, cellulosic and others? We are big investors in those. If we had answers to that today, they would already be in the marketplace. I have one more question to you guys. My time is limited. Um, I have been dying to ask this question all my life, or well, since I was 15 years old and I got my driver's license and paid for my own gas. Um, I always wonder that no matter what is going on in the world, uh, whether there is a war going on, gas prices seem to jump up. Whether the war ends, gas prices seem to stay stagnant or jump up. Whether or not there is uh, disasters or what have you going on affecting oil producing countries, gas prices seem to either go up or stay stagnant regardless. So in my personal experience and many of my constituents, um, that seems to be the case. They go up a lot easier than they go down. Um, so the question I have for you or your industry is, do you document the, the spikes and, uh, and let the public know the whys of those spikes uh, as they occur, or is that too proprietary? Uh, th those, those movements in the price of gasoline, diesel fuel, whatever they might be, are all a matter of record by a number of agencies, particularly government. But let me respond more generally, if I can, Congressman. As you look at the price of gasoline and fuels generally, it is driven, as I mentioned earlier, primarily by the cost of crude oil. Now, what is significant about the new reality in U.S. production today? we are having a significant impact on the potential supply equation on a global scale. In the past two years, the United States is now the number one natural gas producer in the world. IEA, the International Energy Agency, has predicted that if we stay on this course of production increase, we will surpass Saudi Arabia as the number one world's oil producer in seven short years. There was an article just a week or so ago talking about OPEC. OPEC is very concerned about what is going on in the United States today. This has geopolitical ramifications to it that will change the world as we know it. That is why we think we need to get back and refocus on reality, look at things like RFS that were put in place at a very different time under very different assumptions, and deal with the reality today to maximize our potential as a nation to become energy secure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Brandon Berger, um, well, let me first start here. I, I kind of want to just cut to the chase if I can. The law says the EPA can waive the renewable fuel standard if, quote, implementation of a requirement would severely harm the economy of a state, region, or the United States. Uh, does the renewable fuel standard increase the cost of producing turkey, Mr. Brandenburger? Absolutely. Does the renewable fuel standard increase the cost of producing? I know you are in the turkey business, but does it increase the cost of producers in the pork industry? Absolutely. We have got a lot of members who produce both turkey and pork. Does it increase pork. the cost of producing beef? Yes. Uh, and there, therefore, would it be logical to, to assume that because it, the cost of production is up, that the cost of the consumer of those products, turkey, pork and beef is also going to be uh, increased? In, in most cases, yes. And um, Mr. Gerard, does the renewable fuel standard increase the actual uh, uh, cost of, uh, of fuel? Uh, yes, economists and experts say it does. And Mr. Brandenburg, does the renewable fuel standard increase the cost of other non-protein, non-livestock food products, the cost of production, corn is used in all kinds of food products, does it increase the cost of those other food products? The people I talk to in those industries assure me it does. They tell me the, the, the same thing. And, um, Mr. Martin, I think you even said in your testimony we, we, you don't want to expand the uh, food based fuels and the renewable fuel standards. So I guess I go finally to, to uh, Mr. Pugolorisi. Pretty, I hope I got that close. Um, so is all this adding to the cost of the American consumer, the American family, increasing the, the strain on their budget? Is it harmful to the economy? It is very harmful to the economy because it acts like a massive excise tax. But more importantly, we are allocating resources to activities which have very low value added and often harming activity in high value added uh, activities which would help to foster higher rates of economic growth. We now have 10 years of very low economic growth, less than 2 percent. 
we should take a very hard look at our entire regulatory program on the fuel sector because that is one of the drags. Okay. So if I could just quickly sum up then. Every food product that uses corn is seeing an increased cost. Fuel itself is an increased cost, which according to the economist here is going to it cost, make it difficult for every family, every family's budget is being hit by this. And so the simple question is, Mr. Chairman, for the, the, the second panel, the Mr. Grundler from the EPA or, frankly, uh, the acting head of the EPA, Mr. Perciuseppe, or the nominee who is slated to be the head of the EPA, the question is, why haven't you waived the standard? I mean, the, the law is real clear. If implementation of the requirement would severely harm the economy of a state, region, or the United States, you can waive the standard. So we, we, these guys are all great and they are saying everything that I think a lot of us already kind of knew and I think the American consumer understands every time they go to the grocery store or every time they pull into a gas station. So the real question is, from the EPA, why in the heck haven't you done what the law says you can do? And then we can think about how we are going to change the law if we need to and how, how that. But there is relief right now. And so, I mean, I know we got we to gotta keep asking questions of these fine gentlemen, but I, I want the EPA guy up there and say, what, what gives? What is the deal? Uh, this is as obvious and as plain and as simple as it can be. You guys have the authority to help every single family in this country and you won't do it. We want to know why. So I look forward to the second panel. I yield back. Would, uh, would the gentleman yield his final one minute? Be happy Mr. George, you made a comment earlier I would like to follow up on. You made a comment about one of the alternatives is to export more gasoline in this structure. What, what, what did you mean by that? Well, what happens when we get forced into the blend wall, we have to make decisions about what we do with the product. Do we quit producing the product, thus leading to rationing, as some of the economic analysis suggests? Or the other route is you potentially export gasoline because you don't have to attach a rim to it. Has that already started occurring? Well, we, over time, we as a nation have always exported some refined product right. and gasoline. But that is being seriously considered to say to solve this problem, we could export. Well, it, it's it's difficult where we are today, and what's so difficult about where we stand <clears throat> under the law. The EPA is supposed to tell us on November 30th of the previous year what the standard is going to be. Do we, we know that yet for this year? We don't know it yet. We it's heard, past November 30, by the way. It's past November 30 of 2012 that we were supposed to learn what's going to happen for 2013, what's required of us, right? So we hear in January what their proposal is. It's not yet gone final. We don't know today, halfway through 2013, what's expected of us in terms of where they're ultimately going to land because they have the waiver authority that's been talked about on some of these standards. So as an industry, I can't speak for the individual companies, but let me tell you, there is a lot of hand-wringing going on right now, trying to understand the government mindset, trying to understand where EPA is, frankly, trying to understand where the Congress goes next on this. EPA has that authority year by year. Ultimately, this needs to be repealed. It is creating great anxiety in the marketplace. It is forcing decisions unrelated to market factors because of governmental interference, if you will, or drivers. It is a serious problem. I wish I could tell you with clarity what each individual company is going to do. I am merely laying out what the options are, none of which are good until you fix the renewable fuel standard. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. I thank the Chairman for his indulgence. But real quickly, if I could just run down the list. Why, why won't the EPA do what, what seems obvious to all of us? What's, what, what do you think their motivation is for not doing what is clearly uh, needs to be done? Um, I, I can't tell you what's in their head. What I can tell you, Congressman, is if one believes that you can take a government mandate and force the creation of a technology, which I believe is a silly notion, that's the only thing I can come to. Or they are literally trying to reorganize or recraft, if you will, the, tr the entire fuel economy of the United States. We look at this from, for example, our, our situation under cellulosic uh, fuel. As I mentioned earlier in my comments, in 2010, when they came out with a mandate, the fuel didn't exist. We asked them, we said, please waive that down because the fuel doesn't exist. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We got to the end of 2011. We actually had to petition them with a waiver that says, please, in a formal way, waive it down to zero because now we've gone through the year. We all know it doesn't exist. Will you give us relief? And the response was no. So we paid over $5 million to the EPA. I might add that is a new taxing authority from our vantage point. Gave $5 million to the EPA for a fuel that doesn't exist. We came to the next year. What did they do? They raised the number on us, even though it didn't exist in the previous year. 
So we had to go back to the U.S. Court of Appeals here in, in D.C. and get a court to instruct the EPA to waive the standard down to zero. The fact is, it's fascinating. I don't know if any of you would be interested, but in the particular court decision, I, I thought it was, uh, if I can find that real quickly, here's what the court says. The EPA is not allowed, quote, to let its aspirations for a self-fulfilling prophecy divert it from a neutral methodology, end quote. Now, the court mandated that they say, since there is no fuel, give the money back to the refineries. Within days, the EPA issued their proposal for this year. They doubled down. They increased the mandate for us on cellulosic over what it was the previous year that the court had struck down literally five or six days earlier. So I can't tell you what they're thinking. That's a long answer. It's hard for us to predict. I can tell you it's raising havoc in the marketplace. And you've got industries trying to provide consumers benefits and values of fuel at affordable, reliable cost. And now we've got government that's dictating that. It's a real problem. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank you for calling this hearing because I think this issue is one of the most important ones that we face, trying to strike the appropriate balance between protection of our environment and the health of the American people, and at the same time providing a reliable, safe product in terms of the production of oil and gasoline really is no easy task. And, and so it is fraught with a tremendous amount of disagreement. Uh, Mr. Gerard, let me ask you, has the EPA approved E15 for use in any car or light truck model year 2001 or later? Uh, yes, they have, Mr. Davis. In fact, what they did in two, in two steps or in two processes, they granted two waivers. And so now they have approved it for 2001 and later vehicles, yet going back to Mr. Lankford's comment, uh, our research, the uh, Coordinating Research Council, which is a combination of automakers and our industry and the EPA and DOE, I might add, have come to the conclusion based on research that with E15, you put millions of cars at risk, not to mention what you potentially do to small engines, chainsaws, lawnmowers, motorcycles, et cetera. So, yes, they have grant, they've used waiver authority under the Clean Air Act to grant that opportunity, and it's a real problem. Every automobile manufacturer that responded to Congressman Sensenbrenner last year said they will not warranty their cars if they use E15, but the EPA has granted that. Is it legal to use E15 in motorcycles? Um, I, don't, I don't think it is. I think they have specifically excluded this, the, some of the smaller piece of that, perhaps, motorcycle. Let me, let me go back and find that specific detail. It is not legal under the motorcycles, the small engines. Did the DOE find any increased risk of engine damage from using E15? This is a great question. I would encourage the committee to look at closely, because the, in the process of granting the E15 waiver, the EPA had underway an emission standard for catalytic converters on cars. When they decided to grant the waiver, they took that study that was unrelated to E15 at the time and used it to justify their decision on E15. The study that we were participating in, which originally had EPA part of it to design the study, they wouldn't wait for that study to come out. That study was concluded and shows that you put millions of automobiles at risk. So we need to look closely at the science. We believe the science has not been done. In fact, California, the California Air Resources Board, has said we will not use E15 in California. In fact, we believe it will take many years of study to determine if it should be used. Did they find if, if there were no significant changes in vehicle tailpipe emissions, vehicle drivability? are small non-road engine emissions as ethanol content is increased? Well, their conclusions based on an emissions test about catalytic converters was they attempted to suggest that answered the fundamental question of auto durability and fuel systems. The analysis done by the Coordinated Research Council concluded 
it clearly showed impacts on fuel system and clearly showed impacts in some model years on durability, uh, valves, et cetera. So while they attempted to extrapolate, in our view, an unrelated study for these purposes, real research that goes to the real question about the impacts of E15 shows there are serious problems. Let me, thank you. Let me ask Mr. Puglarisi a, a question here. Most consumers think that the numbers on their gasoline pumps, 85, 87, 89, are just synonyms for paying a low, medium, or high price for gas. What do these numbers actually represent? If you are referring to the octane numbers, they refer to the, uh, you know, the, the, the performance that this gasoline does for specific engine types. So if you have a, a cert certain kinds of high-end cars require much more compression, they require higher octane. I think, but most automobiles in America today can operate on 87 to 89 octane. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the panel for being here today. I uh, wanted to talk about a, a couple of different things. Uh, Mr. Brandenberger, uh, in Tennessee we have uh, a lot of poultry. Uh, Hubbard LLC in Pikeville, Tennessee, I don't know if you know Jay Daniels, the Director of Operations, we have sat down and had many discussions. I believe he said about 85 uh, percent of the cost for them is uh, in feed, so this has a huge impact. We also have Tyson in Shelbyville, Tennessee, and I know you are turkey, these are chickens, but uh, what, uh, what is the amount of corn and, and that these, this needs compared to other livestock? What type of? Uh, well, and you are right, I can, I can speak a little more specifically to the amount of you know, what feed costs in turkey production. For turkey, it is about 70 to 75 percent of the cost of production, so, so pretty similar to the numbers you are quoting for, for chicken. Um, you know, I think the most telling thing is, that, you know, there isn't any real substitute for the corn. Yes, there are some byproducts from ethanol production that can be blended in a little bit, but it is not a one-for-one -one substitution. When corn becomes less available, prices go up. I think it is very telling the way the livestock and poultry industry have chosen to handle it. We are buying 1.5 billion fewer bushels of corn now than we were when the RFS was created. So that is your biggest competitor, really, to bring in lower cost to the consumer in the stores is your competition with the ethanol program? That is the way it has turned out. I am sure that is not what Congress intended. Okay. And, and you can't use the distilled uh, dried grain or the DDGs with turkey, and they really can't with the chicken. Well, that is the byproduct emission. We can use it in a limited amount. Uh, some would try to characterize this as, oh, well, it is no problem. We put the distiller's grains back into the market. That is not true. In turkeys, as a rule, 10 percent of the feed ration is about the maximum a distiller's grain can go. And distillers' grains are not of equal quality. Poorer quality grains, you are lucky to get to 5 percent you can blend in. Okay. Mr. Gerard, uh, I want to talk a little bit about small engines. This is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. I just cleaned out my storage shed and I have a pressure washer, a weed eater, and a lawnmower that uh, about $1,000 worth of equipment that were initially damaged by ethanol fuel or the 10 percent ethanol uh, damaged the fuel lines. I have had all these repaired once. I try to buy pure gasoline for them, but I have teenage boys who I think have have put uh, the wrong kind in. And, and it's kind of worked on the weed eater because I've convinced my wife that spraying Roundup along the fence line is better than using the weed eater. It's certainly left la less labor intensive, but I'm not sure she's still with me on that. But really, I mean, if you own a leaf blower, a weed eater, a lawnmower, a pressure washer, um, I, I hail from Sturgis, South Dakota. We have a lot of motorcyclists have talked to me about the uh, the ethanol and gasoline. You know, Tennessee is a great hunting state. We have people who use four wheelers. We have fishing boats. So, can you talk to me a little bit about the impact on small engines and, and why people should be forced to deal with this? Yeah, in that context, Congressman, I'm not an expert on small engines. But let me just say, when you look at the breadth and scope of everybody that's very concerned and, and in many instances opposed to what the mandates of the renewable fuel standard are. This is clearly a focus on many people's minds. As I was in preparation for today, I was reading some material by some of the small engine manufacturers. For example, one uh, piece of testimony, a direct quote from one who had a chainsaw that said these additional blends or these higher blends of ethanol make the machine run too hot. And on occasion, his chainsaw would engage 
whether he wanted it to or not in the, in the course of doing his work. So clearly an adverse impact, particularly on the smaller engines, be they lawnmowers, weed whackers, whatever they might be. And we find in the, in the marketplace, obviously, much like yourself, a lot of people come in and say, I don't want any blend in my fuel. I want the gasoline because as the small engine repairmen and others are telling them, uh, it won't hurt their, their product or the equipment they've paid so much money for. So generally speaking, yes, that whole group, the marine group, the motorboat group, the motorcyclist groups, uh, they're all in part of broader coalition seeking uh, repeal and reform of, of the statute. Okay. And I think you mentioned earlier the actual cost of producing a, ga a gallon of ethanol and blending it in is not cheaper than just regular gasoline. <clears throat> That's correct. The, the thing to remember there, when you look at it on an energy content on a BTU basis, gasoline is generally always cheaper than ethanol. When you look at it on a volumetric basis, they'll say, well, no, ethanol is cheaper, but the reality is you don't get as much energy out of it. Okay. Let me ask one thing. I, I was recently <clears throat> traveling to South Dakota, and I had not seen these in Tennessee, but in Iowa, I saw my first pump that you could choose 10, 20, or 30 percent ethanol, and the 30 percent was the cheapest of the three. Does that make any sense at all to you, then, from what we just talked about from a cost standpoint? It's hard to predict unless somebody has used that as a, a marketing tool, et cetera. As, as, as Lou talked about a little earlier, when you look at the most, uh, the heavier amounts of ethanol, like in E85, the consumer is telling us with their buying practices they don't want it. You look at Minnesota, you look at Iowa, the number of service stations that will sell the higher content fuels, the actual demand for the fuel is going down even though you are increasing the number of service stations. There is about 4 percent of our fleet today that are flex fuel vehicles that can burn it. Only about 1 percent of, of that 4 percent actually use it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So consumers are deciding what they are going to buy, and regardless what the statute mandate or the EPA regulatory mandate is, that is the marketplace. We need to be thinking consumers, number one, two, and three in this discussion. And that is what my consumers in Tennessee are telling me. So thank you for your input, and I yield back. I think I would like to submit for the record a uh, study that was conducted by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, dealing specifically, this was done in uh, 2011, uh, specifically dealing with uh, four-stroke engines, small engines and such, and to be able to get this into the record as well, without objection. Uh, Mr. Horsford, you are up to bat. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses who are here. Um, I, I do want to just start. I know a previous colleague of mine, uh, a couple questions back, kind of implied, you know, what's in the mind of the EPA and the regulators? Why don't they just uh, change uh, their direction, uh, I guess, at the behest of the industry? And I would note that while people may not agree, uh, the RFS is the law, and it was a law that many Republicans um, and former President George Bush implemented. Uh, and so to somehow suggest that the EPA should uh, indiscriminately choose which laws it should uh, properly implement and which ones it shouldn't, I think, is, is questionable. Um, let me get to my question on ethanol production, uh, which has been around for a long time. Um, in the years since passage of the RFS, fuel blends of 10 percent ethanol to 90 percent gasoline have become deeply entrenched in the transportation fuel production apparatus. Uh, Dr. Martin, if the RFS was repealed, is it likely that ethanol would no longer be blended with gasoline? Uh, no, it is not at all likely. And in fact, it was, uh, that was the substance of EPA's analysis last year uh, in considering this request for a waiver. And, you know, they're, they're, in theory, there is complicated economic analysis behind that. But in practice, these RIN prices uh, tell you a story. And, and last year, RIN prices were, were very, very low, only a few pennies. And, and that is evidence that uh, that, that, that people could have avoided complying with the law by, by purchasing those RINs, and there wasn't much interest in doing that. And so I think that's, that's reasonably clear evidence, uh, backed up by much more detailed analysis, that, that in fact 
uh, waiving the RFS would not reduce the amount of ethanol use dramatically, and I think that was an important part of their decision. So as a follow-up, if the repeal of the RFS would not likely have a large impact on cork production for ethanol, what would be its effects? Well, it would certainly uh, stop immediately investment in next generation biofuels. And so that is precisely our concern. We are uh, quite conscious of a lot of the problems uh, with the expansion of corn ethanol. Uh, but at, at this point, uh, stopping the RFS, even, even trying to rewrite the RFS, would, would stop investment in next generation biofuels uh, and sort of lock in 10 percent ethanol, 90 percent gasoline. So we don't think that is uh, the smart solution to the challenges that, that oil causes our economy. We think we need to, to move forward. Uh, but we do need to be conscious of some of the, the challenges and make sure that the, the policy is flexible to address those. Okay. So according to the EIA, total U.S. Pr uh, oil production peaks in 2019 and oil production extracted from tight formations through hydraulic fracturing will peak in 2020, as the ranking member talked about uh, earlier. Then U.S. oil production begins a steady slide. In essence, the shell boom uh, just delayed the inevitable by a decade or so. Uh, the EIA, EIA projects imports will continue to contribute roughly half of total U.S. crude oil supply. That means Americans will continue to spend roughly $300 billion per year on oil imports, a large share of which comes from poli politically unstable and hostile regions. Uh, Mr. Girard, since the RFS was adopted in 2007, the private sector has invested billions of dollars in the renewable fuel space. What actions and at what level in, of investment has the oil industry made in the past five years to ensure that our nation's distribution infrastructure is ready to distribute higher blends and new fuels? That is a great question. We are the leaders in investment in technology, particularly as it relates to fuels, zero carbon emitting, low carbon emitting technologies. Let me give you one quick fact. I can't tell you the last five year number, I can tell you the last decade number. From 2000 to 2010, uh, the Federal Government spent about $43 billion to develop these new technologies. The rest, uh, the oil and natural gas industry spent about $71 billion over the same time frame. And the entire rest of the industry outside the oil and gas industry spent about what we did, and that is $74 billion. So when you look at those investing in new cutting-edge breaking technologies, the oil and natural gas as a sector is the leader in making those investments and making things happen. Now, there may be a second part of your question that is an important one, Congressman, to answer, and it goes to the infrastructure question. And this is a myth I would like to dispel. 97 percent of all the service stations you see out there today are not owned by the oil and natural gas industry. They are small businesses. They are ma and pa operations. In fact, 58 percent of those service stations that are out there are single station owners, meaning they only have, they only have one station in their portfolio. <coughs> so when you look at potential costs associated with infrastructure attached to a government mandate, to uh, distribute a fuel, you need to look at the actual ownership. It is estimated between $25,000 and $200,000 per retrofit of a service station to be able to implement, to change the station. But can I, can I ask promoted. specifically then, what have the oil companies, your members, done to support those ma and pa uh, station owners? We have relationships with most of them to produce the fuel that they request and ask for to make their business thrive. That is the business we are in. So, but specifically and, and monetarily, what have you done? What have your companies done? Uh, we have done everything that we should do to promote the use in the, of the product uh, longer term, from promoting the product to producing the product to distributing the product, everything associated with that we do, we continue to do, and we invest billions of dollars here in the U.S. doing it. Thank you. I know my time has expired. If you could please provide the committee with those examples uh, in how the oil companies work with those small business Happy owners. to do so. Thank you. Dr. Gosar. Thank you. Mr. Girard, 
um, is um, I'm going to ask you kind of a general question because you're, you understand the dynamics of, uh, of our economy. Um, a family is having a harder time putting food on the table, true or false? Um, all economic indicators are true. They're having a difficult time. More people are on food stamps. Are they not true or false? That's my understanding. <clears throat> That's my understanding. I'm not an expert in that area by any yeah. means. Mr. Brandenberger, uh, could you answer the same questions? That's my understanding as well, and obviously in the current budgetary time, SNAP is under a lot of pressure right now. Gotcha. Mr. Martin, true or false on both those questions? I have no expertise in those. Oh, come on now. You're a consumer. Do you go to the store? Come on. You can't be a heartless scientist. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a heartless scientist, but I try hard to stay within my area of expertise, and I don't have any special expertise. Let me in ask you, area. you don't need an expertise like this. Don't hide. What's that? Don't hide. You don't need expertise on this. This is, this is general economics 101. There are more people on food stamps than five years ago. I've, I've, I've read that in the newspaper. Okay. It's food prices are going up. Uh, compared to when, I guess. Is five question. years ago. I, I really don't know off the top of my head. Have, you bought, have, you, have, have you bought turkey lately? Uh, How about yes, beef? Like, yeah, it has gone up. So it wasn't so, easy, it wasn't so hard to realize it either. <laughs> Mr. Pugliarosi, can you answer those two questions? Yes. Yes, definitely gone up there. Well, you know, Mr. Braley, the, the, the ranking member introduced this, this letter by Mr. Braley, and he quotes that it has supported over 63,000 jobs in the state of Iowa with ethanol. I want to go back through this and, and, and just show the, the implications to this economy, because I want to put people to work under your numbers of seven, $770 billion. When converted ethanol, when converted to ethanol, a bushel of corn yields $1.80 per gallon for its energy content, which can produce up to 2.5 gallons of ethanol. Alternatively, a bushel of corn fed livestock can produce 6 pounds of beef, 13 pounds of pork, 20 pounds of chicken, and 28 pounds of catfish. In terms of job growth, critics argue that 1 million tons of corn used to produce meat and poultry can produce 3,600 direct jobs. However, 1 million tons of corn used to produce ethanol only supports 145 jobs. If Mr. Braley is correct that these ethanol jobs created 63,000 jobs in the state of Iowa, he just gave up 1,564,000 1, jobs. That is the same number because of what it would be with the industry. I mean, I am doing the calculation based upon what everybody else is giving me as numbers. So do we have a jobs crisis in this country, Mr. Jordan? Uh, absolutely. And I will tell you from the oil and gas perspective, we are doing everything we can to create good paying jobs to provide stability and help families. So I want to come back to this. So when, when we are trucking, most of this is trucked to little towns here and there. The major fuel for trucks is what? Diesel fuel? Yeah, that is a go. great answer. So Good. technically in the next couple of years, we may run technically out of being able to produce any diesel fuel. True? Uh, under the RFS, it has clearly brought us to the brink of, of a crisis. So we are not really asking for not to use uh, these ethanol, you know, the, the 10, but it is expanding beyond that, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so it is just common sense. So let me ask you another question. Um, when we are talking about our economy, you know, and I am from the state of Arizona, so a lot of it is tourism and recreation, right? So a lot of people take, just like my friend Dr. Desjardins was talking about, they take their four-wheelers, they go on a boat ride, all these things. When you don't have access to that, that uh, fuel, it causes a problem, which means cars will break down, because that is what it does. If, if I am not mistaken, alcohol lifts rust, right? It causes problems and it jams up the engine. That is one of the biggest problems that we have with ethanol. So when mom and pop are driving across the country, cars break down, can't find the fuel, so they are on the boat, the boat breaks down. When they are in the woods, the four-wheeler breaks down. When they are on the road going to Sturgis, the bike breaks down. So we are spending more time trying to fix things than in actually enjoying the tourism industry, which is a huge impact. So not only does this hit us at our food table, because more and more people are having harder times you know, putting food on the uh, cost-effective food on the table, but when we try to have enjoyment of, of tourism, uh, which is a huge industry in Arizona, it's going to pay a major crimp into that. And all we're asking, I just want to make sure we, we're asking the right question. It's not about 
that we believe in the standard of the, the, the ethanol 10 rule. It's just to have some common sense in its application, because as the science is, we're, we're, we're backdropping ourselves into a, a catastrophic uh, situation, which everybody loses. And it, what we're asking is some common sense. Isn't that true? Uh, that's our view. It just boils down to, in our view, common sense. And, and do you think that Congress, when they gave, and you alluded to this, this, this uh, court case, when Congress gave the rules to the EPA, did they intend to have common sense being used? I do not believe for a minute it was the intention of the Congress for this to get us to the point it is today. I think that is one of the problems. We see this over and over, uh, big government saying that they know better than the rest of us, when common sense is being kicked out the window. I yield back. I would like to submit for the record as well a, uh, a written statement from Boat U.S., uh, just talking specifically about the recreation engines and the uh, effect of the RFS on, uh, on boating in America. With that, um, uh, with that objection, I would like to recognize uh, Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for being here today to share your views about this very important issue. Dr. Martin, I very much appreciate your thoughtful analysis and forward-looking recommendations for the renewable fuel standards. I agree that while not perfect, the RFS is a critically important and promising policy for our nation's energy future. The RFS is critical to U.S. energy security. It's a it is a national security imperative. It promotes price stability at the pump and holds promise to significantly improve our environmental footprint. It is also a major driver of innovation and job creations. And in fact, the biofuel industry supports 54,000 jobs in my home state of Illinois. Many of these jobs are in the Chicagoland area for things like research and development, construction, engineering, grain purchasing, transportation logistics, legal services, financial services, and accounting. And we are at the forefront of innovation for advanced biofuel production. And in fact, when I bought my F-150, I made sure there was a flex fuel vehicle, and I have burned E85 for the entire 120,000 miles I have on my truck. Um, and my engine runs very, very clean. And I happen to know, uh, Mr. Gerard, where every single E85 gas pump is within a 100-mile radius uh, of my house. Um, and you are right, some of those are going away, but uh, I am trying to drive up that demand as quickly as possible. And in fact, my husband and I are strong supporters of aviation biofuel. Uh, Dr. Martin, you state that the RFS has the right goals, and I agree. Can you provide more details about why these goals are so important and why it is worth sticking with a policy that even you have acknowledged is not perfect? Uh, yes, uh, I would be happy to. Thank you. Uh, so when, when I look at the RFS, I see sort of three primary goals. Uh, I described more biofuels, uh, but not just uh, the same biofuels that we have, uh, but moving on to, to better biofuels. And really, when you, when you look at the scale of what we are trying to achieve with uh, bringing clean, low-carbon, domestically produced biofuels into the market, you know, we can't get there with uh, just expanding the current biofuels for some reasons that have, have been discussed today. Uh, so we really need to bring the, the next generation that are, that are made from, uh, from agricultural residues like corn stover uh, and from, from perennial grasses, uh, and there is a lot of work going on in Illinois uh, in the, the science and the agriculture of, of producing those uh, fuels. Uh, so, you know, that is where we are trying to get. That is what those uh, that is what those key goals are. And the, the technology is really the, the foundation for the investments that are, that are moving us in that direction. And I think uh, the, that is what, that's what I hear from people in the industry, is that you know, their ability to continue to raise money, to continue to, to innovate, and to, to you know, make the U.S. a, a leader in this, in this technology, and to convert that uh, technology and R&D leadership into actual fuel that we can use, you know, that really rests on a stable policy foundation like the RFS. Thank you. And, um, you know, I'd rather my dollars at the gas pump go to American innovation and research and supporting American biofuels than to Middle Eastern oil any day. Um, Dr. Martin, in your testimony, you acknowledge that the ciliosic biofuels have not yet lived up to their potential. Uh, why is that? And can you explain how you see these fuels uh, markets in the future developing in the future, and how your policy recommendations will help move the industry forward so that we get to a better place with them? Sure. Uh, well, uh, the it, 
if you look at the, the time it takes to develop any large industry, and, and the fuel industries are exceptionally large industries, uh, you know, it's clear that, uh, that it, this is going to take, uh, take some time. And I think one of the things that sometimes confuses people is you will hear somebody say, hey, you know, we are five years away, and, and then five years passes and people say, hey, where are you? But, you know, the guy that told you he was five years away uh, brought that, uh, that pilot plant, brought this technology from a laboratory, you know, and built a, a, a big factory and is making uh, instead of, of gallons or tens or, or hundreds of gallons, they are making millions of gallons of fuel. And, and that is a huge step forward, and that is where we are. We have really uh, moved into the early commercial phase of this industry. Uh, but millions of gallons of fuel uh, does not get you, uh, you know, to where, uh, to, to mandate levels that are in billions. And so it just takes time to, uh, for the next round of, of plants to expand capacity. Uh, and, and to follow those investments. And so the, the ability to, to scale up to really provide those opportunities, you know, really does rest on uh, continuing to, to develop this industry and to kind of providing the stable, uh, you know, regulatory uh, framework that uh, gives the investors the clarity about whether there will be a market for this fuel when they have made their investments. Thank you, Dr. Martin. And I am out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Mann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Dr. Martin, I think I, I tried to understand. Did you make a point about the, the RINs, the cost being a couple of cents, and there was a, an opportunity to purchase them? Yeah, I mean, the way the RIN system works is uh, that if you, uh, you, could, you, you don't need to blend ethanol. If you are an obligated party, you can, you can purchase RINs instead of blending ethanol. And, and how, is that, how does that work? So you, what was the market? You said it was a couple of pennies per, per gallon? Or? Well, the point I was making was that last year, uh, RIN prices had been very low, uh, almost, almost nothing. And, and that was indicative of a situation where the mandate wasn't binding. Essentially, uh, nobody was needing to buy fuel because of the mandate. Uh, and if, you know, if they didn't like to buy fuel, they could, they could avoid that uh, by buying RINs. And so the mandate hasn't been binding until now. Now, the RIN, uh, one so thing has the market changed since the mandate has been binding? Yeah, absolutely. And so now. How's it changed? Well, now RIN prices have, have real value. They are about 80 cents. And, and they are how much? They are 80 something cents, I think. Somebody said 89 cents something uh, today, uh, which actually is not a, it's not, as they say, it's not a, it's not a bug, it is a feature. I mean, that is the. It is not I've, a feature. What, what do you mean it is a feature? I mean, that is the, provides the economic support that makes drop in fuels, that makes the higher blends more attractive. That is the design of the policy. The design of the policy. But let, let, me, let me go through this because I am trying to understand. When you are talking about the design of the policy, the design of the policy was that I have a refinery in my backyard that mm -hmm. probably supports about 10,000 jobs and is critical to the airline industry, also critical to the support of, had they not been there, the implications of what happened during the storms in New York and New Jersey mm -hmm. would have been significant. So there's a lot of implications. But uh, just the other year, when they were dealing with these RINs, they were about four cents per gallon. They're now about a dollar per gallon. Mm -hmm. So the implication for this refinery is, it is now costing them $150 million more a year to, to, to operate because of these RINs. They purchased the refinery for that price. Mm -hmm. So in effect, the regulatory policy is, is driving this, this refinery right back into a point in which it is noncompetitive and it is going to shut down. What do you tell the workers? Uh, I think the uh, I, I don't have anything to say about the specifics. Uh, have you ever been unemployed? Uh, yes, I have. All right. Uh, so, the I think what's important here is that there's there's big opportunities in the next generation of fuels, and we need to manage the challenges. With How do we manage policy? this? I, we, I know there's uh, big opportunities. We need, and I and I share your goal of trying to get here. But this is the unintended consequences of compelling something to happen in a market when it when it when the market isn't able to do this. Has real life consequences on the workers in my district. And you, you, know, you this is your quote. Uh, we didn't build it overnight. But you can destroy it overnight. You can destroy this industry. You can destroy the fact the, the refineries in my backyard overnight, because all they need is a couple of years of losing 150 million dollars or more, and they shut down. Mm -hmm. And then when you close a refinery, it doesn't come back. So how do we work in, in, in this market during this period of time? to adjust for the realization that people are manipulating this, 
this room market to the disadvantage of people who are doing their best to keep planes flying in the sky. Clearly, as far as transparency and making sure the RIN market is working effectively, I mean, that, that's an important part of the policy working, you know, because it is key to the policy. Mr. Pierre-Racy, what, what, what do you say about this? Look, the RIN prices are rising because they reflect the high cost of crossing the blend wall. And this is a fundamental flaw in the program. So we are going to impose very large costs on the production of E10 jet fuel. We are raising the cost of producing uh, petroleum products in the United States. And so it is a very high cost program with very little yield. It is not a cost effective way to advance the, uh, our programs to bring on the fuels of the future. I am so curious, are foreign airlines having to live by these same standards where they are? Absolutely not. So in other words, what we are doing is we are subsidizing a situation in which it now becomes more competitive for foreign airlines to fly into our country than it does for ours to operate globally. Absolutely. What is going to happen is we are going to raise the cost of all the petroleum products in the United States. By the way, when you export these products out of the U.S., our foreign purchasers are not asking for them to be blended with ethanol or cellulosic or anything. So you are going, going to impose a very large cost on the national economy and foreign Foreign operators and producers will not face that cost. So we are creating, this is the proverbial sending jobs overseas. Absolutely. With the unintended consequences of policies that aren't doing anything to clear the air because the bottom line is you will move some of that product overseas and it will be used over there at higher emission standards and won't really change anything in the overall atmosphere. Absolutely. It is actually more serious than so, that. So we need some kind of, I mean, there needs to be some recognition, a workout in the meantime. And I share your goal of some, but, but this is where we are talking about the variance or the stop or the something. Instead of this dead ahead objective that the EPA is going to do it regardless of the implications that are happening to real people working in real communities with real American jobs here at home, which this administration and others pretend to stand up and want to fight for. And I can't see another person who finally got back to work looking at the idea of that gate closing because somebody has got a policy that might work somewhere 15 years down the road while we are also simultaneously exporting the very same products that are impacting the, the, the air just as bad because they are being done in China or someplace else at an economic competitive disadvantage to us. Frustration with the fact that people aren't using common sense in the implication of where we need to go together. Mr. Gerard, I, my time's up, but I don't know if you've got a thought on that as a closing point. No, Congressman, I can't articulate it as well as you did, but let me just thank you for your leadership. You've made a big difference in those refineries up there, but this, you've, you've hit the nail right on the head. <clears throat> We've got a government policy now that is bringing us to the brink of a crisis. EPA has the authority that you, the Congress, granted them to waive this and to take this pressure in the short term off of the crisis. But ultimately, the Congress needs to deal with that. We don't disagree with all the noble goals that have been talked about in terms of energy production in the United States. And as I mentioned earlier, we are leaders in trying to find the next breakthrough. But the reality is, getting back to people and jobs and what it is going to take to fuel this economy, we better get smart quick or we are going to have a self-inflicted wound that is going to be very difficult to recover from in a lot of different ways. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your indulgence and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Norton. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Dr. Martin, you know, every, like every red-blooded American, I'm already always looking for science to rescue us from the last <laughs> dilemma, and I'm afraid that when we in, in, when we embraced ethanol, uh, that was uh, for many uh, such a, a quick and ready, and much too quick and ready an answer. Uh, now, uh, as far as I can understand, it costs more by the time. One of the reasons that environmentalists like me wanted to do it was to save um, energy. Well, I <laughs> understand it costs, by the time we get to the finished product, it costs more <laughs> in, in energy um, uh, or certainly as much as, as fossil fuels. So <laughs> we are not meeting that goal. So instead of just jumping to the next um, 
generation, that was the first generation of biofuels. Let me ask you about the second generation, which looks so hopeful to me, but I got to ask somebody. Uh, and there you sit. And I am talking about the cellulose uh, biomass that apparently we have <laughs> in plenty, plentiful supply. That is what we thought uh, about ethanol, too, because of, we didn't think about the effect on the cost of, of, of um, corn and sugar, and especially uh, not only here, where we could absorb it more easily, but had an, it has had a, a terrible effect in other uh, parts of the world uh, which are very dependent on, on such uh, food stuffs now. So when I look at this 1.3 billion <laughs> in harvestable uh, cellulose biomass that uh, we have, quote, identified in the United States, before I get my hopes up, uh, uh, and grow too rosy in my expectations since uh, there are some estimations that that could uh, more than meet a third of the domestic transportation fuel demand before I go there. Uh, I need to know more about what I understand is, is happening. Uh, you seem in your testimony not to, be, not to believe that uh, uh, we have yet found an answer to the Linwall d dilemma, and you speak very specifically. Uh, about uh, the effect on food, on uh, of food-based uh, fuel oils on you know food, <laughs> to be blunt about it, uh, and I th th that's a major concern that we don't jump from the fire into uh, fr from the from the frying pan into the fire itself, uh, and you seem to call for rulemaking that would reset expectations. Uh, I need to know what that means, but specifically I need to know what it means in light of the fact that it looks like the private sector is finally getting into uh, this new second generation uh, 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 energy uh, supply, uh, that there may be as many as 20 in 20 states, may be uh, uh, plants under construction, also in, in Canada. Um, um, how would you, what does that mean? When you get private investment <laughs> taking the risk, does that mean we are on our way to very significant use of second generation uh, biofuels? And what could EPA do to adjust to that if it is a real answer? I am most interested in whether it is a real answer. Uh, yeah, I think there is a, there's a big opportunity. And as, as you mentioned, there are uh, facilities that are, that are starting up all over the country. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, because the energy industry is so large, it, it's sort of important to kind of keep the, the timeline and the expectations uh, sensible. And if, if you look, look at what natural gas has done, you know, once, that? but look what natural gas has done, you know, once it, once it became truly viable, whoa, it shot up sure. and has affected uh, 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 the supply here and across the world. That's why, that's why I want my expectations to be raised again. Right. Well, I mean, so if we look at where we are and, and, and what can be achieved when there is a, a stable investment environment, you know, I think uh, we see over the next 20 years that, that, uh, that these next generation biofuels, together with more efficient vehicles and other technologies, can really help us to cut projected oil use in half in that time frame. So, you know, in that 20 year time frame, we can make a very dramatic impact on on the impact that consumers, because of course the, the biggest uh, way to address the impact to consumers of, of fuel is to, is to use less of it. Uh, and, and biofuels are a, a significant part of, of a comprehensive What would be the idea. effect on, on, on energy, on climate uh, uh, issues? Uh, any difference? Uh, Absolutely. In? I mean, these, the next generation cellulosic biofuels have dramatically lower carbon emissions than, than the conventional biofuels and, and even lower compared to the fossil fuels that we are relying on now. And so that is why they are an important part of the strategy going forward. You say it could grow rapidly from 2013 forward. What do you envision? Uh, I mean, well, obviously, it takes several years to build one of these facilities, and you don't build a hundred of them at once. You, you know, you, you build. So, if you know, if we already have twenty states, mm -hmm. uh, when, when do you think some of this could get to market? Oh, it's going to get to market this year. I mean, uh, the first facilities are commercial facilities. They're completely built. They're starting up now. So, 
the, you know, the gallons will start coming in, but there's a difference between millions and billions and tens of billions, and it takes time to, to move up that uh, uh, scale. Well, thank you, Dr. Markin. I'll keep my expectations high for the moment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Farenthold. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'd I do have a thank the panel and do have a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Martin, in your testimony, you say uh, that the goals of the uh, RFS, Renewable Fuel Standards, are more biofuels, better biofuels, and beyond biofuels. If you take a step back, uh, you want to talk about what some of the broader policy goals are uh, besides just uh, biofuel? Sure, absolutely. And I, it was beyond food-based biofuels, uh, not beyond biofuels as the third goal. Uh, so the, the, the overall goal is to, is to cut our oil use. As I was just alluding, the, the challenges that, that our oil use causes to our, to our economy, to our uh, uh, security, and to our climate are, are substantial. And the best way to address those are to take practical steps to cut our oil use. Right, so you're basically saying cleaner air, more domestic uh, uh, production, and in, in, in doing away with uh, the need for uh, importing foil. Would that be fair? Uh, we can cut our, our oil use dramatically, yes. All right. What, what about, uh, as, and so let me uh, go to uh, Mr. Pugliarossi. You're talking about coming up on the blend wall. So as we use, as we have less use of, uh, of fossil fuels, we're coming up on the blend wall, which means we have to use more ethanol than we can blend at a reasonable percentage. Is that Yes. Is, is that correct? I guess what I'm getting at is, aren't we kind of on a collision course with ourselves as we, uh, as we promote more fuel-efficient vehicles and then as we move to alternative electric cars uh, or as we move to natural gas-powered uh, vehicles? I mean, it, it, it's going to get worse and worse over time, isn't it? Well, I think you know, we, we sort of get stuck on these volumetric or these mandates instead of looking at how do we want the economy to function most efficiently, most efficiently to get the most economic growth. Right. And what, if we try to wrench the economy too fast to very high cost and often uh, infeasible fuels, we are going to impose a very large cost. All right, let us talk a little bit about uh, uh, natural gas. I can go out and buy a natural gas powered uh, pickup truck for uh, about six to $9,000 more uh, than, a, uh, th than a normal pickup truck, much more clean burning than, uh, th than, than oil based. And uh, it is economical for me. Once I hit 90,000 miles on that truck, I will have paid for it and will be saving money every time isn't uh, so why shouldn't we be focusing some of the efforts there you're asking a very good question because is this mandate really a cost competitive or a low cost strategy compared to, to something achieve, like that, yes. compared to the other things that are out there and the answer to that is probably not all right, Mr. Gerald, you represent the oil and gas industry. Uh, we have got great technological breakthroughs in uh, hydraulic fracking, and we are all but giving away natural gas. What is gas today? It is in the $4 range? Yeah, give or take. And uh, we, do, do you see any substantial increase in that over the next few years? Well, if you look at the quick history of this, which has literally occurred in the past few years in the United States, once again, calling into question the assumptions under the renewable fuels. Right. The fuel standard, which is a very different day. But when you look at natural gas today, going back to this broader objective, if we talk about climate okay. issues and carbon Clean, emissions. Cleaner and domestic. Well, today we are at 1994 levels for our carbon emissions. Why is that? Because of natural gas. That was driven by the marketplace, not by a government mandate. And we are within Kyoto standards for now, right? Didn't, that, didn't we get there, we're getting even though we are not a signatory? We are getting very close to that as the leader in the world in terms of reducing our carbon emissions. But the market brought it about, and that is why we have got to take away some of these efforts to compel technology. The movement to natural gas in vehicles is occurring as for all no, the reasons. No government involvement. Precisely. And that will happen. That is what we need to inject back into this conversation. And just as far as projected reserves of natural gas, we in trouble in five years? Uh, they, it depends on whose estimates you look at, anywhere from 100 to 250. All right, so years. we're talking a couple of hundred years. At least. So it kind of takes the heat off developing. That number keeps growing every year. All right, so it kind of takes the heat off of, uh, off of some of these numbers. And just, uh, let me go uh, with one question with respect to food prices, these renewable food standards. They are affecting meat, poultry, your turkeys, uh, chickens, you name it. It is also affecting just 
corn for people, isn't it? I mean, worldwide? It, it certainly is. I think Ms. Norton made a, you know, made, made a very good point uh, you know, about the impact, and we would agree. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about the impact on our energy on our energy here, and we ought to talk about the impact on people and, who are facing food insecurity as and, well. And in, in other countries, particularly where not, not as wealthy as we are, uh, substantial increase in corn prices, I mean, corn is a part of the staples in, in many countries. I think in, in Mexico there was one study that said since the renewable fuel standard took effect, tortilla prices are up 60, uh, 69 percent. There, there's actually civil unrest at times in Mexico over the corn prices. There have been demonstrations there. But it, it, it is other countries, but it's also the food insecure in this country as well that are affected by this. Uh, so I, I, I see I'm out of time. I just want to conclude by saying we really do need to uh, take a step back and let the, see, see if we can solve some of our energy problems and our environmental problems in the marketplace with technology that's there today rather than trying to force some, something. So I'll yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for being a part of this panel. Uh, we're going to shift to the second panel. All of you, uh, great contributions in this. Lou, I think I counted the mispronunciation of your name probably eight times uh, through the course of this. And so I appreciate all of you being here and uh, for what you contributed in both your prepared statements and your oral. Thank you. We'll take a short shift into the second panel.